Okay, so welcome everyone to the next video in our series. Today we have Aishwarya with us who has kindly joined us on the call and is going to um, give a little insight into her experiences and as an LGBTQ person who's thriving in the law. So I'm just going to introduce you to Aish very quickly. So Aish is an openly bisexual person of colour, passionate about diversity and inclusion and all things legal. She's a first class law graduate from the University of South South Southampton and as of this year she's a future trainee solicitor at Clifford Charles. Congratulations on that point by the way. Thank you. During her secondary school career Aish established an LGBT mentoring club to help students come to terms with their sexuality and gender identity. Continuing this during her A-levels she wrote the biological thesis Deconstructing Homophobic Myths in Science for which she placed as a top four finalist for the Lonza Scientist of the Year Award 2018. Then during university Aish created the diversity-focused commercial news website, All Things Legal, alongside her in intersectional team to help democratise access to the law across social groups. The team has since advocated on various pressing issues such as autism and neurodiversity in the workplace, gender-neutral letterheads and diversity pay gaps. Aish aimed to provide aspiring solicitors with well-rounded and honest information to make decisions that fit them and, that's, and has so far helped over 3,000 students. During this time, Aish held the position as her Law Society's D&I Officer, so Diversity and Inclusion Officer, where she organised and implemented diversity panels with intersectional professionals in the law. For her dedication to D&I, Aish placed as a top 14 finalist for the LGBT Undergraduate of the Year Award 2020, which was sponsored by Clifford Chance, and she did so while achieving strong academics too. For example, Aish was awarded the Scott Bailey and Glanville, uh, was it Glanville de Mont or Darmont? Glanville de Mont, yeah. Glanville's de Mont Prizes for best performances in Lambs Law. In her early commercial law journey, Aish was an avid participant of aspiring solicitor schemes, placing as a semi-finalist for their LGBT scholarship and partaking in the first and aspire schemes. In aspiring solicitors commercial awareness competition 2020, Aish placed as a semi-finalist, placing in the top 3% of all participants. Currently, Aish is working as a junior negotiator at Deloitte, and she will commence her training contract with Clifford Chance in February 2025. Outside of work and the law, in the very little spare time it sounds like she has left, <laughs> Aish is a passionate filmmaker who aims to, through her films, destigmatize and decolonize discourse surrounding pressing social issues such as racism and sexual violence. So just to introduce the chat that we're going to have today, if that's okay, Aish, first of all, thank you so much for kindly agreeing to have this chat as part of our video series for LGBTQ plus History Month, which is, of course, in February. As you know, we're having a chat with people who are members of the LGBTQ plus community and are thriving in the legal profession. So we're hoping that the series will inspire our members of the LGBTQ plus online network society at the University of Law and anyone else who might be watching as well or listening to our podcast. Um, we're hopefully, hoping especially that we're going to be inclusive of our many international members who aren't able to take part in the online events and this is due to their wishes to remain anonymous. So the anonymous participation of these members is mostly due to the fact that the LGBTQ plus community are not accepted in the countries they live and they study in and we're hopeful that this series will not only be a way that they can be included um, but also it will act as a beacon of hope that you can be your true authentic self and thrive in the legal profession. So, as a key example of that, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm gonna move, thank you so much. And we're going to move on to our first set of questions. So, the first questions are going to have a bit of a legal focus. Um, so, Aish, you're currently working as a junior negotiator for Deloitte. Can you tell us a little bit about what attracted you to this role and what the role entails? Sure. So, broad brush, essentially. I'm currently working with an international investment bank on negotiating and executing their over-the-counter derivatives contracts, um, which uh, you know, are governed by various international rules, such as the SEC margin rules and the UK MR rules. And basically the aim of these contracts is to enable over-the-counter derivative trades to take place. So there are two types. There's uh, the exchange market where you can buy uh, commodities, you know, you're actually buying future contracts uh, of oil commodities, for example. Um, and then there's the over-the-counter, which are privately negotiated, and those are the contracts that I tend to work on. So um, essentially, we help our clients hedge against counterparty risks, uh, such as um, you know, payment default or insolvency by the counterparty. 
And so my job essentially is to draft agreements that actually identify what collateral will be securitized for each trade based on the particular securities available for the counterparty. And then to execute these agreements. So it basically means you know, signing the agreements and getting that all um, officiated. So that's essentially what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And what drew me to the role is essentially my interest in the banking and finance sector, um, specifically within commercial law. Um, so as you previously mentioned, I'm going to be training at a commercial law firm and that's where my interests lie. And really I wanted this to uh, be a bridge between uh, what I had studied at university. I graduated last year. And then between that time till my training contract, I wanted a regular reinforcement of my commercial awareness. And I thought that this would be a fantastic opportunity to, to do that, really. Amazing, thank you. So looking forward to 2025, as you sort of touched on just there, and as I mentioned earlier, you've just accepted a training contract with Clifford Chance. So once again, congratulations, and they're very lucky to have you. Would you be able to tell us a little bit more about why you chose to accept the training contract with Clifford Chance? Sure, so I kind of alluded to my interest in banking and finance earlier. So aside from the work that Clifford Chance specializes in, which is global financial markets and corporate law, which are two areas I'm interested in, um, as a bisexual person of color, as I mentioned, it is very, very important that my law firm um, facilitates an inclusive workplace where I feel comfortable in my authenticity. And ultimately, not only that, but the firm that I work for goes further above and beyond using their platform to advocate for change in their local communities and in their wider communities as well. And I felt that Clifford Chance did that best. So uh, I networked uh, at various firm events, uh, except 2020 and 2022 are two events that they um, that I've been a part of. Accept is an event that's geared towards LGBTQ plus individuals from diverse backgrounds. And honestly, for anyone listening, for anyone watching, it's an amazing, amazing uh, open day. So I would highly, highly recommend. But one thing that stood out for me, uh, for me when I attended those events was the fact that the staff were incredibly inviting. The vibe was banter filled and it was clear that the firm genuinely cares about its staff. And there I networked with other trainee solicitors and I learned about the firm's reverse mentoring program and their strong Arcus network, which by the way, Arcus is Latin for rainbow. Um, I felt that, you know, I can achieve my, my fullest personal and professional development best at Clifford Chance. And not only that, I can harness my intersectionality, my own experiences to bolster the diversity initiatives. And I think that that's really what the deciding factor was for me because you know, it all boiled down to, will I have the freedom and the encouragement from my firm to continue doing what I love, which is being a DNI advocate. So it all checked out. Fantastic, amazing. We actually also had someone in the series, um, Tom, who did a yeah. had a conversation with us, and he's one year into his training contract with Clifford Chance as well, and he had the exact same view, which was that he had the opportunity to um, get involved in diversity and inclusion, and that was a massive factor for him in deciding to go with Clifford Chance. So it sounds like they're a great firm to work yeah. for. And I've actually worked with Tom as well. Um, you know, we, we go way back. Yeah, no, I, I worked with him uh, on All Things Legal, my my legal website. <laughs> oh wow, amazing! Well, yeah. everyone knows each other. All roads lead to Rome. It's a small world. <laughs> um, okay, so if we could just move on now to your experience as an LGBTQ plus person in the legal sphere, and try and talk about some positive steps that we can take to overcome barriers. So we're sort of hoping that through the conversations we're having with people in our series, we can try to create a bit of open discussion, which we hope will address the issues that LGBTQ plus people face head on in the hope that then we can try and overcome them. So can you, in um, your experience, can you shed any light on any issues that you face as an LGBTQ plus person? And do you have any thoughts on positive steps that we could take to address these? Sure. So I've been quite privileged in the sense that I haven't faced any overt discrimination in public settings or in, in the law. You know, of course, I'm sure that many, um, if not most, LGBTQ plus individuals can recount the unfortunate situations where, you know, we've been called the um, F word or another slur on the streets or on a bus or in school. And I've certainly faced those, but I've been very fortunate to not have been uh, discriminated against at work or major social spaces. However, I have grown up in a conservative Indian uh, family where my parents have struggled to come to terms with my sexuality um, and my gender identity. And it's 
it's been an incredible learning curve for me. But since I came out in uh, 2015, uh, my parents have had an incredibly receptive mindset. And, and I've been incredibly lucky because they've been very, very willing to learn and even stand up for me in front of uh, my extended family members or my conservative friends. That being said, I have met individuals who haven't had the same experience with their parents as I have, and they don't have the same support system um, in their local community to seek help. So I see on a regular basis on social media, people campaigning uh, on behalf of uh, LGBTQ plus individuals who are in need of, say, social housing, or they need money for gender reassignment surgery. And I think that in these instances, it's extremely important that uh, we as fellow LGBTQ plus individuals, uh, we as allies, um, are doing what we can to um, educate ourselves on the issues that other peers face. And we're actually taking active steps towards doing what we can to alleviate some of the discrimination and disparity in their communities. You know, and I think that, you know, for example, there are several GoFundMe pages um, that that you could get involved in to to contribute to these people's lives. You could pay, um, you know, 10 pounds, uh, but it could help cumulatively contribute towards someone's rent, you know, someone who's homeless and in need of housing. Um, so I think that, you know, whilst I have had a very privileged um, background and I have faced some disparities in my own um, intersectionality, um, I think that there are uh, pressing issues that are facing our communities right now. And it, I think that regardless of whether or not those issues are affecting you or myself, we should take the initiative as allies, as fellow LGBTQ plus members to, to help people where we can. Yeah, absolutely. I think your point relating to homelessness is really poignant because um, I don't know the exact statistic, but um, a good place to look if you did want to know yourself, you wanted to have a look into it, is AKT, are a charity that do a lot of work for LGBTQ plus people who face homelessness. And it's so much more prevalent in the LGBTQ plus community yeah. because people do get, unfortunately, get kicked out or they end up in situations where they don't have a home, they don't have people that they can turn to because they're isolated. So, yeah, I think it's a really important issue and anyone who's listening to this could definitely um, do with looking into it and have a, have a read. Um, especially for LGBTQ plus History Month, it's important to know, it's important to celebrate the, the um, hurdles that we've overcome, but it's also important to think about the barriers that we still have to face. So um, that'd be amazing. Um, okay, so moving on to the next question, we also really want to offer lots of support and encouragement to LGBTQ plus people who are considering or are pursuing a legal career. And one way that we thought of doing this is to sort of let them know that they are that there are other people like them um, who are thriving in the legal world, hence the video series. So with this in mind, if you could go back in time and you could visit your law student self and give yourself one piece of encouragement, what would that be? So coming from a, a STEM background, I took biology, chemistry, maths at A-levels. Um, and so when I began my legal degree, I had no idea what law was, <laughs> really, um, apart from what I had seen on suits, um, which is not a, a good reference point. Um, and so I had a lot of teething issues, uh, you know, with exams and with internships. Suddenly everyone's talking about internships and commercial awareness. I was like, what, what is this? Um, and so it's very easy when you're in that vicious cycle to feel like uh you know everything is is above you and and that you can't possibly uh you know get on top of things you know you have this imposter syndrome where you feel like you, you're not worthy or you don't belong um and so that's something that i definitely faced a lot of in in my university years um mm -hmm. and i know that it's a major pressure point for other law students um and non-law students alike who are pursuing a career in such a competitive field such as law not only in your undergraduate, which is the experience that I have, but as well in your masters and, and your SQE, your GDLs, um, you know, your LPCs. So I did take steps to alleviate this. You know, I started all things legal and I tried to develop my knowledge as much as I could. However, that worked out great. However, um, that didn't mean that, you know, every day wasn't anxiety fueled. It, it was and my self-worth was heavily tied to how productive I was that day or whether I had secured an internship or not. And so I guess coming to your question, if I could go back and give myself one piece of advice, it really would be I, that I wish I had taken those things less seriously because during my second year of university, I kept getting burnt out 
Um, and I realized that I, I really had to rethink how I view productivity generally. Um, and, you know, I had to remind myself, look at myself, my mind, my body, and come from a place of gratitude and grace and say, you know, I appreciate what you're doing um, for me. And I think that it's only fair that I give you the self-love, the loving language, the respectful language, and relaxation in order for you, I'm speaking in third person to my body, um, in order for you to recoup yourself and be ready for the next day. So um, I took my work-life balance a lot more seriously after my second year of university. And that's when everything started to fall into place, ironically. And I saw my grades improve, my commercial awareness improve. And after university, I secured uh, a vacation scheme at, a, at another global law firm, as well as now a training contract. So if I could go back and give myself one piece of advice, I would say, I know it's easy to have imposter syndrome. And you know, when you start your, your training contract to my future self, Lord knows I'm going to have imposter syndrome, but try best as you can to express gratitude and grace for what you've achieved so far and try not to worry so much, try to worry less. And I promise you, I promise it'll all click into place. I promise. I think that's absolutely fantastic advice and I would definitely echo that. I think it's so easy to have imposter syndrome for anyone. Um, but I think especially for women or for LGBTQ plus people, where there might not necessarily be role models in the area that you want to work in, you sort of think, I need to do as much as I can to prove my worth, to prove why I'm here, to prove Absolutely. that I do fit in. And then you end up burning out because you've pushed yourself way too far. And I think that that's a fantastic message that you left people with, which is that sometimes you need to look back and look at how far you've come and look at all the things that you've achieved rather than always constantly looking forward and thinking about the next thing and working out what your next step's going to be. You sometimes need to just take that moment and, you know, really respect how, how much you've achieved so far. So I think that's a really lovely message and I definitely agree with that. Um, so also another question sort of on the same, in the same vein, an area that is often overlooked in discussion Discussion surrounding LGBTQ plus issues is intersectionality. Yeah. So um, a lot of people who are listening will be LGBTQ plus or an ally, so they probably already know what this is. But for those people who don't, the Equality Network gives a really good example. So I've um, sort of stolen that from them. I'll link it in the bio. So <laughs> they don't um, annoyed, but credit where credit's due. This is from the Equality Network, and they said that an example would be that a black man might experience racism and a gay man might experience homophobia, but a gay black man might experience both. And they took it further and said he might also experience um, both at the same time, and he also might experience racism within the LGBTQ plus community, or on the flip side, he might experience homophobia within the black community. So there's all sorts of issues that that person is facing. Yeah. Um, and this can also translate, um, I should add, to gender, for example, someone who's a woman and LGBTQ plus, or with religion, for example, who's someone who's Muslim and LGBTQ plus amongst, there's many other intersectionalities that can occur. So um, if I can ask, have you experienced any difficulties having um, intersectional identities yourself? Um, and do you have any thoughts on how we can address these issues? Sure, I think that's a, a fantastic definition that you've given as well. Um, it's, it's very important to recognize that we are all intersectional individuals to some extent um, and and because of that we have complex issues it's you know when we think about LGBT um, issues it's it's not a one-size-fits-all we have to be adaptive we have to be inclusive we need to decolonize and destigmatize discourse right around these types of issues um, I'm bisexual uh, or queer uh, I, I go I go by both um, I'm gender fluid and I'm a person of color uh, I'm a first generation immigrant um, and I'm a proud Hindi. So I have felt the issues um, that come with uh, being intersectional firsthand. And um, as I previously mentioned, one issue was having to reconcile my sexuality with my traditional Hindu um, uh, traditions and my traditional Indian background. And in Hinduism, Gender fluidity is a concept that we have been familiar with for uh, millennia in the scriptures. Um, and in, in the original text, transgender individuals, uh, for example, were seen as you know, being one of the closest to the gods. Um, but you know, post-colonialism, the societal interpretations of these texts have since deviated and, but it's brought some solace knowing that um, even millennia ago, 
there have been civilizations, there have been indigenous tribes that have recognized the sheer diversity of human beings. Um, and therefore, I will be unapologetic in expressing myself. You know, this is not something that's new. This is not something that's only in the Western world. You know, there are so many stigmas out there um, about LGBTQ plus individuals. Um, but I gain solace and peace from the fact that um, we are so diverse and there is a lot in science that we are yet to discover and that we don't know. And so right now it's just best to live in a moment. Um, so how can we alleviate and reconcile this with prejudice in our communities? It's, it, it's really by having this holistic appreciation for the diversity that we have as human beings. And I, and I think that having respect for others, regardless of whether or not you agree with how they choose to live, having the respect for others and how they choose to live their lives is I think most important. And I think that that's how we can address these difficulties. You know, people fear difference. And within modern society, you know, we are, we are made to see each other on pedestals. That's just how society has, has arranged itself in a hierarchical manner. And rather we are sitting at a table across from each other, regardless of whether you're a partner at a law firm or you're a trainee solicitor, you're sitting at the same table, equal. Um, but you know, this is something that uh, one of my, my um, icons, um, Alok Menon, uh, they spoke about in a podcast um, and they are absolutely right. Uh, we as people see ourselves as having the right to judge others when really we're all equal and therefore we have a collective responsibility to educate others on the issues impacting our peers and showing our peers the same respect that we wish to be shown out for ourselves. So I've definitely faced this as an intersectional individual. I've definitely faced you know, various different types of discrimination and, and there's layers to it. But I think mm -hmm. that the way that we can begin to peel back those layers, start to understand those issues, is by first of all, realizing that human beings are way more diverse than we know. And I think it's, we need to look at each other on a, on a, a level playing field, uh, at a table rather than at a hierarchy, um, so that we can understand that there's a lot that we don't know. And so therefore, let's just live in the moment and let's just be present um, and let's just embrace and, and, and put out love rather than hate. Yeah, fantastic. I think there's um, strength in diversity, there's strength in difference. And I think that's a fantastic answer to that question. I think that will really resonate with a lot of people who are listening to this. And like you said, uh, you know, to fair, varying degrees and some, some more than others, but everyone it has intersectional identities. So um, I think a lot of people will um, really learn a lot from that answer. So I'm going to move on to the next section, which is LGBTQ plus opportunities. Um, and this is a great section for you because you have taken on loads of different roles, <laughs> um, which have allowed for you to make a social difference in particular. But we're going to specifically focus today on the impact you've had in terms of the LGBTQ plus community. So at school, you're an LGBT plus mentor, um, sort of slash diversity inclusion mentor. Then at university, you started All Things Legal, which was a, a diversity focused commercial news website. And you were also the diversity and inclusion officer for the university's law society as well. So can you talk to us a little bit about why you took on roles where you acted as an advocate for diversity and inclusion? And just sort of, yeah, if you could touch on why you were so passionate about being so vocal on these matters. Sure. So I guess let's start with the why I took on the roles. So, you know, I, I try to be the type of person who takes the initiative to fix a problem where there is one. Um, hopefully that'll make me a good lawyer. But uh, that's inherently who I've been as a person. I tried waiting to see if, you know, there's a particular issue, tried to see if that would be fixed or so someone else would come along and and hopefully take that brave step. Um, I kept waiting, I kept waiting, nothing happened. I stopped waiting, I got bored, I got frustrated. And so I took the initiative myself. So um, at school, I was approached by a teacher who mentioned that a boy hadn't come into school for uh, two months because he was experiencing bullying due to his sexuality. And so I was implored by the teacher and also I felt that it was my responsibility um, to help the student come to terms with their sexuality because at the time I was one of the only openly bisexual people of color um, and so it was really out of a, a feel uh, out of a duty rather that I wanted to step in and, and create uh, a change 
he ended up coming back to school, finishing his uh, GCSEs. And um, I'm very glad that he, he did that. And so seeing the impact that that had made on, on someone, I wanted to carry that on at university. So um, I wanted to continue giving back um, and joined as a diversity and inclusion officer at my law society. And so I organized um, a lot of diversity panels um, featuring legal professionals, um, particularly in, in the commercial law sphere, as that's the sphere that I had the most contacts in, including Tom um, as well. And um, so, uh, you know, that's, that actually allowed more people in our law society who maybe weren't so comfortable in the sexuality to actually have um, an open discussion about seeing law as a viable option, being so intersectional themselves. Um, and along the same time, I created all things legal um, as a means to educate others on the development of DNI strategies that law firms were implementing. Because at the time, um, there was this huge influx in DNI strategies, um, but the efficacy and the realism of meeting those goals was somewhat elusive. And I wanted to create an environment where law firms can be accountable and where diverse individuals like myself um, can come to a platform and see reliable information upon which they can then base their life-changing decisions, which are, you know, for example, applying for a training contract. Um, so really that was, that was the impetus for creating All Things Legal as well. Again, I collaborated with Tom um, for an article where he spoke about his experiences being LGBT um, and being neurodiverse and how that's affected um, his uh, career, not only in, in, in business management, but also now in the law. Um, so really to reiterate why, you know, I feel like if there is a problem or not even just a problem, you don't need to take the step only where there's a problem. If there's an opportunity to make great change, then it's better to be the person that you wish came along to make the change. Don't wait for the time to come because it may never. Um, so seize it now, carpe diem, seize the night, I suppose. Fantastic. That's amazing. That's such a good answer as well. And I think um, I listened to a podcast by Joe Sigwell. It wasn't by him. It was Sally Penny. He has a podcast called Talking Law. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's brilliant. And she talks to various legal professionals. And one person she spoke to was Joe Sidhu Casey now, um, who is a barrister, a criminal barrister. And he is really, really um, a strong advocate for diversity and inclusion. And something he said that was really poignant was if you want change, you have to challenge things change yeah. comes from challenge and you can't just sort of say I want change we want this to happen or we're going to make a change you have to be the person that actually challenges things and who steps into that role as scary as it might be that is the only way that we're going to make a difference and it sounds like you have done that continually throughout your education and now hopefully moving into your career and um, I think it's a brilliant thing and it is going to help so many people also in this video series yourself and other people who I've spoken to um, have uh, most people have spoken about the lack of role models or being in that situation that you described where you're waiting for someone to do something and you just you wait and you wait and you get bored and it just never happens um, and we've all felt that frustration but all of the people who've taken part of the video series are all the kind of people who say yes and do want to do something and want to make a difference and there's so many people like that in the community and I think that's such a wonderful thing and that's why there's been so many positive steps that have been um, taken to improve the experience for everyone. So, but I um, also say actually um, yeah. at that point as well, you know, making change doesn't have to be, um, you know, shouted from the rooftops. Making change doesn't have to be you're at the 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 foreground of of the change. You're the one that's trailblazing. Being mm -hmm. a trailblazer, being a role model, being someone who takes the initiative, it can be a very very small spark that ends up snowballing, snowballing into something bigger. You could be that spark. You don't have to. Um, hold the torch and 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 stand at the at the you know at the front of the line. You don't have to do that. If that's not the type of person that you are, mm -hmm. you know that's perfectly fine. But you can still make change with the voice that you have because everyone has a voice. And I think that that's very important to remember as well because oftentimes we we see role models as being loud and proud, but you can still make a lot of change. You know, it, a droplet makes an ocean they say yeah. you know so uh, I definitely want to highlight that as well um so if there's anyone out there who who has um a slightly different you know communication style may not feel comfortable um putting themselves forward because they themselves are coming to terms with who they are that's absolutely fine um but my uh LGBT mentoring club at secondary school started because 
I had a sit down conversation with um, a person who didn't come to school for two months. I had a sit down conversation for 15 minutes and that snowballed into 15 minute conversations during lunchtime, um, you know, twice a week. And eventually they came back to school and, and actually um, they let me borrow their wig for my prom and I won best hair, which is fantastic. Uh, <laughs> um, but that, that, that relationship started from a small spark, 15 minutes just in a room, just me and them. And that was it. And, and that was enough to make, to make sustainable change. So change can look, uh, come in many different ways, shapes and sizes, but never forget that you can make change um and that you have a voice yeah absolutely or even just being part of a society or being part of a network where you speak with exactly. other people and you talk about issues they might be the person who if you're not that sort of personality they might be the person who does something um, and they've remembered the, what you said to them and that's you're adding your voice to the sort of like yeah the movement so i think that's yeah absolutely. fantastic so finally, can we please talk a bit about the LGBTQ plus opportunities that have been offered to you? Because we've spoken a lot about what you've given back to other people. So um, I noticed that you have had a lot of interaction with aspiring solicitors. Would you mind telling us a little bit about these opportunities and what they meant for you? And um, would, were you glad that you got involved in these opportunities? Sure. So first of all, what is you know aspiring solicitors? Um, you know, it's a, it's a it's an incredible, and I truly mean incredible organization created by Chris White. Um, he's a qualified lawyer from Norton Rose Fulbright, who grew up in a working class family. He attended a non-selective state school and graduated from a non-Russell Group university, and so he has had first-hand experience of discrimination and stigma around underrepresented communities. So he wanted to create an organization organization that helps democratize access to the law across social groups uh, and that includes BAME individuals, uh, those from low socioeconomic backgrounds, those with disabilities, refugees, LGBTQ plus individuals. The list is endless and I'd highly recommend checking the website out because it does actually state you know um, who are eligible for their schemes um, and, and, and it's a very very broad net so definitely check it out um, for anyone listening and watching. But I was part of two schemes that they had. So they had um, AS First and AS Aspire. So AS First was uh, an opportunity available for first year law students and penultimate year um, non-law students, as well as there are other um, groups as well that are eligible, um, where students can expect to receive in-depth CV um, building advice and feedback on their CVs. So it was around, uh, a three month to four months long um, coaching scheme where you got allocated a uh, coach who actually had um, experience in graduate recruitment. So the advice that you're getting given, you, can, you know, you can have confidence that it is valid and it is coming from a person who has experience. Um, and many of these graduate recruitment specialists also have trained as a lawyer and have shifted over. So it gives, you know, a double barrel. It's fantastic. Um, and because of AS First, I was automatically placed onto AS Aspire, uh, which is the next level up. And it's a program uh, which uh, is geared towards application and interview advice, um, as opposed to CV. And um, all in all, the impact that Aspiring Solicitors has had on me has been incredible. I don't think I would have been able to secure the training contract that I have secured, um, you know, at the firm that I have secured with, had it not been for the strong foundation that Aspiring Solicitors had built for me during my university years. Um, so it's it's been incredible for my legal development and I highly recommend for anyone listening, anyone watching to learn more about this organization and get involved in their schemes or their ambassadorship um, opportunities as well. Because of course, as an alumni, um, many people don't know, but as an alumni of AS First and Aspire, you can return back and I, I hope to uh, return back um, and, and give back and be an, be an ambassador for the law firm um that you are training with um if that law firm is a partner firm of the organization so get involved in any way that you can it's an amazing amazing institution thank you so much that's so helpful hopefully some of our listeners or watchers will be able to look into um aspiring solicitors and see if it's the kind of scheme for them 
Um, so the next section we have is on question questions that people are afraid to ask. So we invited questions from our members, which um, some, well, most of our members were within the community, but we also invited any questions from outside the community as well um, that people would like to ask an LGBTQ plus person um, and they might not know that person, or they might be afraid to ask that person. So we said that we would put these questions to our um, participants for our video series. So the question that we would like for you to answer is um, why do LGBTQ plus people need to have a whole month in brackets pride and a special flag to celebrate their community you know this was actually a question that my uh, my baby cousin you know he's 13 but i still call him my baby cousin and i always will um <laughs> that my baby cousin actually asked me um yeah. when he was at school and they had pride uh, month and um yeah it was it, it was exactly the question that he asked me and um and this is what i kind of I kind of explained to him. So why celebrate LGBTQ plus people in the first place? You know, why Pride? Well, Pride Month is about acceptance. It's about equality. It's about celebration. And it's about community. And having experienced for hundreds of years, if not thousands, ridicule, discrimination, uh, imprisonment, and even death for expressing a particular gender or sexual identity, LGBTQ plus people come together in the month of June, uh, which is Pride Month, or in February, uh, which is LGBTQ plus History Month, um, to celebrate the existence, history, and work of LGBTQ plus individuals, um, and also to raise awareness around uh, the issues that are, are affecting our community as well. And we have this month because similar to why we celebrate Black History Month, similar to why we celebrate South Asian or AAPI History Months, um, for the longest time, we've lacked a voice um, to advocate for not only our collective struggles, but also to cherish our collective achievements. Um, and so having a month allows us to take some of that limelight to the, um, you know, at the center stage to proudly say, we exist and we matter, AKA, I'm here and I'm queer, uh, <laughs> which uh, our community has very, very elegantly um, termed. Um, so the month of June, it's very significant uh, because this was the month that the Stonewall riots took place um, in 1969 uh, in New York, where basically people were condemned for their sexual and gender identity. And this is often why LGBTQ plus um, as a term encompasses both gender and sexual diversity because it's in this movement, the Stonewall movement, um, where uh, Marsha P. Uh, Johnson threw the first brick, um, who was a transgender woman. And uh, we saw transgender men and women, lesbian, bisexual, intersex, gay, and queer people form a community um, and express their, their collective experiences. And, and this is what led to the monumental change that we've been seeing over the last couple of decades, and we still have a ways to go, where we are now able to, regardless of your sexual identity or gender identity, in many, many parts of the world and in more countries, are able to marry or partner with who we love. So that's why we celebrate Pride. Um, and we have a special flag because um, we need a flag for everything. And, and the flag that we have is quite frankly iconic. Um, we have a special flag to celebrate. Um, I think for me, it's to celebrate our diversity as human beings, as I mentioned before, right? When we think about a rainbow, we think about um, bright light, we think about positivity. But not only that, we think about, um, if we were to go to my STEM background a little bit and we went back to physics, um, if we shine a white light through a, a, a glass prism, right? You know, some people will be aware of Pink Floyd's album cover. You see that white light being dispersed into the colors that make up the, the singular light. Um, it's because we as a community, as, as human beings, we're, we're not just singular. We're made up of diverse people um, from diverse backgrounds. Uh, that's what makes society so great. Um, and so I think that's why we have a, a pride flag to represent the fact that we are so diverse as individuals. Um, and I love the fact that our flag also evolves over time, um, recognizing that there are 
specific disparities and specific achievements that intersectional people, as you know, we discussed earlier, have made. So now in our flag, we have a special place for um, people of color uh, with the black and the brown um, uh, you know, colors in, in, in the pride flag. So I think that really pride in general is about celebrating um, the achievements that we as a collective have made um, recognizing the, the struggles that we currently have still and have uh, overcome, realizing that work still has to be done, and also recognizing the fact that we are so diverse as individuals. And I think that it's a beautiful thing to celebrate. Why wouldn't we? Mm. Yeah, amazing. And you know, I think so many people who are watching this probably have had that question before. And sometimes in that, when you're caught in that moment, you struggle to have an answer, but that is a brilliant answer. And the only thing that I would echo everything you've just said, the only things I would add, I think is, um, Pride and uh, either Pride or in LGBT History Month, another amazing thing that comes out of it for LGBT people, as, as well as, as you mentioned, looking back at um, the achievements that we've we've had and looking um, sort of at the moment and in the future at the struggles we still yet have to overcome. Um, another amazing thing is just the community feel, like when you go to Pride and you are surrounded by people who are just like you, there's no better feeling than that. And Absolutely. in LGBT History Month, you're looking at iconic people and you're looking at historical figures that you never even knew were gay. And you think yeah. <laughs> there have always been gay people. There always will be gay people. Exactly. There are people like me and I am not so different after all. And that, that community feeling and that inclusivity is so wonderful. And, and that's just an amazing thing that comes out of Pride and LGBT History Month. And the flag as well, I think what you've just said is so lovely and how colourful it is and how it's ever evolving. Um, it's so important to us and other people don't appreciate that as much, but hopefully what you've said will enlighten them. Um, I also think it's an amazing uh, sort of indication of safe spaces. So when you're walking through London and you see a Pride flag um, hanging down from somewhere, you think, I'm going to be fine there. I'm probably going to have a good time. I'm going to have lots of laughs and I can be myself. So I think that the flag also indicates safe spaces for people, which is so important Absolutely. to LGBT people too. Um, but yeah, amazing, amazing answer yet again. Um, okay, so we're sticking with the theme now of LGBTQ plus history month, moving on from that question. Um, but as this video series is for LGBTQ plus history month, um, I just wondered if you do have a favourite iconic member of the LGBT community that has perhaps inspired you. Sure, I, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but um, my absolute icon would have to be um, Alok Menon, um, who is a non-binary LGBTQ uh, advocate who aims to champion gender diversity and does so in such an articulate, very poetic way. Um, the way that they speak on why gender identity is such a difficult concept for, for people to digest, the way that they speak about how you can be a better ally, um, it's, it's incredible. And for me, they are an icon because I hope to one day be as articulate and as poetic as them um, when, when I'm, I'm advocating for the issues that I care about. So um, they use spoken poetry, they use stand-up comedy, they use literature um, as a means to express and recount their own experiences and and there's just something incredibly poetic and incredibly powerful about the way that they speak about these issues it's almost as if anyone can understand what they're saying um they make it so easy to to understand and so easy to digest um so i just think that they are absolutely iconic and i love how they are their authentic self and and don't care what other people think and it's, of course, taken them time to come to that stage. But it really shows that if we as a community support one another, if we as allies can support our LGBTQ plus um, peers, we can all live to our most authentic selves. Even if you're, you're you know, not part of the LGBTQ plus community, supporting us allows you to become a better version of yourself because you're choosing love at the end of the day over mm -hmm. hate. And I think that's so powerful. So... Alok is an incredible reinforcement of that message and, and so for that reason they are my absolute icon. <laughs> Amazing, thank you. I've actually never heard of Alok Menon so I'm going to definitely check them out. Definitely they check sound them out. fantastic. So thank you so much for your recommendation. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so um, I just wanted to quickly shift the focus back over to you before we finish up. Um, so before we go, it was mentioned sort of briefly earlier that you spent your time, or you do currently spend your time actually, as an independent filmmaker and a uh, founder as well. Um, so you have won numerous awards at international film festivals and carry out a variety of roles, including screenwriting and film direction. Could you tell us a little bit more about this? Sure. So um, I run an independent film production company called Mother Mile Productions. Um, Mother is the place that I was born in India. Mile means peacock, which represents freedom. Um, so Mother Mile Productions. Uh, and as an intersectional LGBTQ plus uh, person of color, um, living in a very Eurocentric, heteronormative, able-bodied world, um, I figured that I, I have two aims with my filmmaking. I make short films, but would love to one day make a, a feature film or more. Um, and I have two aims. The first, as I alluded to earlier, is to destigmatize um, discourse. And the second aim is to decolonize discourse. But what do those terms actually mean? They are quite elusive. Um, you know, destigmatization means to break down the barriers and have the necessary conversations on the topics that society hides. And destigmatization off the back of that is creating a space for the Commonwealth, particularly to heal and grow through connecting on our shared experiences and then educating others on their, on our perspective um, and their perspective as a, as a collective. So um, those are my two aims with filmmaking. And, and currently I'm going to be producing a film that I've, I've written, which is based on indentured labor, which is a period of history that um, was uh, immediately took place after post-abolition of um, the African slave trade, but it's a very little known um, period of history and I'd love to shed more light on it. I've also advocated for issues such as sexual violence. Um, and so I think that it's very, very important. Again, as I mentioned before, if you see something lacking um, or if you see an opportunity to create sustainable change, then be that person who does so. And I realized that in our Western media industry, there's a huge uh, misrepresentation and un underrepresentation of people of color, particularly South Asian people of color. Um, and so I wanted to use my voice to advocate for the issues that I care about, such as ethnic representation, sexual violence, um, you know, historical um, education about, about uh, BAME history and, and so on and so forth. So, that's my aim with filmmaking, essentially. And it, it yeah, it, it does take up my time. <laughs> so I'm just wondering if there's there any particular place that we can access these films or watch them because they sound amazing or is it? You can indeed. Um, I, I do have um, some films up, links to my films up on my LinkedIn page, um, as well as that I, I have my own portfolio website, which is also yeah. in my LinkedIn page that people can check out. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and really, that's it for me with the questions. I would love to hand over to you just to see if you have anything to add or to emphasize. I know that we have covered so much in this conversation, so it's perfectly fine if you don't, um, or if you just have any sort of closing comments or a note to leave uh, people with. Sure. I think that for me, um, when we were talking about how, you know, the LGBT community has been around for millennia, has been um, around for so long, um, and we are so diverse. Something that came to mind was the fact that when I graduated, um, I, uh, in my graduation photo, was wearing um, all the rings and the watches that my, my uh, grandparents had, had, had given me on, on both sides. On the one side, um, my maternal side, my grandmother had gone to university and had um, excelled very much in her career. On the other side, um, on my uh, dad's side, he, uh, my grandmother hadn't um, finished primary school. And, and that's because they, they didn't have um, schools in their area to give them secondary school education. Um, mm -hmm. So they only went to school until 10 years old. And that made me realize at the time that when I'm here taking this photo and I'm, and I'm ha holding my, my diploma, um, I am representing not only, you know, all the um, near and dear family members who have helped me get to this point, but I'm also representing all the women, particularly um, who have been destined to be housewives in, in, in my family and in, in other families in India. Um, or I'm also representing all the people who haven't yet had the same kind of 
privilege that I have had to go to school, regardless of whether you're a man or a woman. Um, I'm representing every single one of those people by holding this diploma. And so that was something that came to mind. And I, I'm mentioning that now because when I wake up every day, I try to remind myself that in me being proud of who I am, I'm representing, I don't even know how many people because it's truly unfathomable. I'm probably representing millions of LGBTQ plus individuals that have not been able to express themselves and, and be themselves in their communities because it's been too dangerous for millennia and millennia and millennia. Um, and I'm representing those people by being my authentic self now and here. And that allows me to be present. And I think that that's incredibly, incredibly important. It's not easy. Um, and I recognize that, especially when you're in a country or you're in a family where you will get kicked out or you will get um, you know, domestic violence against you or you will be imprisoned. You may face death. It's not easy to do, but I hope that it resonates with people that having at least the self appreciation and self love for yourself, not, you don't have to, you know, be out and proud yet, but ha at least being comfortable with yourself goes a long way. Um, and, and I hope that, that that resonates with people. It certainly has resonated with me. Yeah, it has definitely resonated with me as well. And I think um, your journey has been so inspiring. You've done so much to give back and um, you've had so many poignant and important messages just in this conversation that we've had today. I've only met you, well, this is the second time that we've ever met, not in person, um, but I, yeah, I'm really, really grateful that you've been on this call. And I think a lot of the stuff that you have said will mean so much to a lot of people that are gonna be watching this. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for doing this uh, conversation and hopefully you're now part of the network and that we stay in touch in future. Absolutely. No, thank you so much for having me. This has been such an incredible um, opportunity as well um, to talk more about how others can give back um, to mm. their communities. And I, and I, like I said, I hope that resonates with people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. <laughs> All right, Jessica. Um, 